Alison Stein is a novelist and freelance journalist who has written for the likes of the New York Times, the Washington Post, and the Guardian. Growing up in rural Ohio with a hearing impairment, Alison turned to reading and telling her own stories as a way of staying involved. In the process of reading, she realized that the stories of people where she came from weren't getting out into the mainstream. She decided to help fill that gap with her own work. Fast forward to today in the era of lockdown, and Allison is balancing her roles as a mother and full-time writer. Splitting her time further between fiction and freelance projects, she helps people feel comfortable and less alone with her work. To learn more about Allison Stein and her journey, be sure to listen to today's episode of the Fearless Storyteller Podcast. Hello, and welcome to the Fearless Storyteller Podcast. I'm your host, Ethan Freckleton. Have you ever noticed how fear stops us from creating and sharing our best work? Join the Fearless Storyteller as we explore the heart and soul of writing stories, songs, and scripts that sell with the people who write them. Each guest has their own unique hero's journey and insights into the intersections between limiting beliefs and success. Have you ever wondered what it would be like to have a personal life coach? Coaching works best when you're invested in your journey. Even so, you may have wished you had a support team in place to help you through your ruts and to celebrate your successes alongside you. If only you could afford it. That's why I'm offering an incredible deal right now for the supporters of this show. For you. I've used coaching services in the past, and I know what it's like to be witnessed to have my brilliance reflected back to me when I can't see past my obstacles or my doubts. I know what it's like to feel heard and valued by someone who's been there right where I am now, and to have permission to be imperfect and to be powerful. In exchange for your support on Patreon, you'll receive monthly one-on-one -on -one sessions with yours truly. I'm a certified master life coach, and I've worked with best-selling authors, award-winning filmmakers, and everything in between. Wherever you're at on your unique journey, no matter the milestone, your goals, or experiences, I'm here to help. And now we can help each other. Support the podcast right now by joining the Storyteller Mentorship Club. Get the coaching support you need, and be a part of my journey as a fearless storyteller. It's a win-win for everyone. Visit patreon.com forward slash Ethan Freckleton today. That's E-T-H-A-N-F-R-E-C-K-L-E-T-O-N. You'll also find a link on the podcast page at ethanfreckleton.com. And now, on with today's show. Uh, Allison Stein, welcome to the Fearless Storyteller. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for saying yes. So we were just mentioning that um, I learned about you via a previous guest, Ingrid Seymour. So Ingrid, thanks for connecting us. And, uh, you know, looking deeper into what you do, you, you strike me as somebody who does lots of this stuff <laughs> <laughs> or has done lots of stuff, probably not all at the same time. But what would you like to share with listeners about yourself? Well, I'm a writer, specifically a novelist, and I work as a freelance journalist. Mm -hmm. That said, I do also write in all genres. I started my career as a poet, mm -hmm. and I have a few books of poetry, um, and I also have a background in theater and in visual arts. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> so you couldn't just pick one. You'd just do everything. Well, you know, I feel like... If you're creative, that creativity extends in a lot of ways. And um, I'm someone who always wants to keep learning new things, which is one of the reasons that journalism works well for me, because I'm always, you know, like you, meeting new people and hearing their stories. Yeah. And I really enjoy that. Um, but I also feel like if you're a creative person, you know, that creativity bleeds over into other areas. Mm -hmm. And sometimes 
you know, sometimes a story doesn't fit a certain format. Sometimes it needs to break out in another way. And sometimes, you know, you need to do that, too, in order to keep going and keep feeling inspired. Yeah, I think there's something to that. Um, you know, I I go through this periodically, and I'm wondering what your experience is with, you know, you, you ever feel like, oh, what I'm doing right now is like the thing, and you're so energized by it. And then like, you know, you figure out that you can do it and you've done it well. Do you ever feel like that energy shift? Like, oh my gosh, why am I not excited? Why do I want to do something else? Do you ever feel that? Yeah, I, I do feel that. I think, you know, I also think if you're creative, you know, you like a challenge because I mean, we wouldn't be writers if we wanted an easy life, you know, it's just, it's not easy. It's not easy for almost all of us financially or emotionally or creatively or at any level. Um, So I think, you know, and I think part of being a writer is just constantly learning. You know, you Mm. have to be curious about the world and you have to keep finding ways to challenge yourself. Definitely. So how are you challenging yourself right now? Well, I am writing full time, which is certainly a challenge. Um, and how I've been able to do that, it wasn't exactly my choice. Hmm. I was working full time as an editor, but then, you know, like a lot of people all across um, careers, I was laid off. Hmm. And so I had to kind of make it work as a freelance writer. And so, um, I write novels, but I don't make a living on that. I make my living and pay my rent through through doing journalism and freelance reporting. So it's a challenge for me to balance those worlds. My more analytical reporting work that I do to pay the rent and my much more creative, you know, passion work of fiction, which I do, you know, for me, basically. Um, so how I've, how I've worked it out in my head is I – you know, the pandemic has thrown all of our work days into disarray, and we've had to constantly reinvent how we get it done. Yeah. But um, I, when I'm writing a book, I work on fiction in the morning. Okay. I really feel like as soon as I get up, I've just had coffee, I haven't even eaten yet, or hopefully checked my emails, um, and I just, I'm just i fresh as creative, creatively. Mm-hmm. So I try to write... Um, I try to write fiction in the morning, and then I use kind of lunch as that break, and I spend the rest of the day doing my day job work, my mm. reporting work. Yeah, I, I hear that a lot, and it, I I know personally for me, I won't put words in your mouth, but you know, having children that you know that while morning time is the creative sweet spot, it's not always what's available. <laughs> well, what I used to do before the pandemic, mm. um, I, I've been a single mom for most of my child's life. And, um, you know, the day he went to kindergarten was a, a really exciting day for uh-huh. me. <laughs> I, um, I went out with some friends in the morning and had champagne for breakfast. And then I went home and got to work. So back when he would go to school, I would walk him to school, which was also really nice to kind of start the day being outside and going for a walk, I think that helps you creativity, creatively yeah. too. So I walk into school and then I come home. It would be like eight forty-five in the morning, and I would immediately start to work. Yeah. Now you know school is in his bedroom, so he's not really going very far. We don't get to go outside, and I don't have that kind of undisturbed time. So mm. I am still working and I'm still writing. I I finished the draft of an a new novel, a very rough draft a couple weeks ago. Um, I joked to my friends that the novel was written entirely during my son's Zoom meetings. So maybe yeah. I should like thank them in the acknowledgments or something. But, you know, it, it might be different. I mean, the, the style of my writing might be different. Yeah. I think that the style of all of our work might be different now yeah. because we do have to do it in such fragments, right? Yeah. We are just grabbing time whenever we can. We're being interrupted a lot more. We're probably feeling a lot of stress and anxiety, most of us. Mm. So, you know, the writing may change and the process may change a little bit. Yeah. So true. Well, I'll rewind a little bit and you know, maybe go a little deeper and I'll throw you a softball first, which is, you know, <laughs> why writing? Like, why did writing become such a focus in your life? 
I don't feel like I had a choice, to be honest with you. I feel like one of my very first memory is when I was a little kid, I was sitting underneath the kitchen table while my parents were having dinner and I was trying to write a story. And my mom was an elementary school teacher, and so she taught me how to read really young. And I just would fill notebooks with all the words I knew. And at first it wasn't very many words, but I always felt drawn to tell stories. Mm. I think part of that may be because I grew up in the country. We lived in a very rural part of Indiana when I was very little, um, next to a farm that grew popcorn. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, I didn't, I didn't know any other kids. I couldn't go to somebody's house to play. And so I was just kind of alone by myself in the field, you know, and I would just think of stories to keep myself company. Um, and I would imagine friends because I didn't have any yet. And so I think I just had those friends talking in my head and I've never lost that, that impulse, I think, to, at first to make myself feel not as alone, but, you know, as I got older, maybe to try to think about helping other people feel not alone, mm -hmm. to be comforted either by telling their own story or just telling a story to keep someone, you know, comforted and make them feel not as lonely. Because mm -hmm. you understood how important that feeling was. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And so... <laughs> so that was the beginning. So, yeah, and that, and as a as creative play and as an outlet, I can see that. Um, when did that start to shift into maybe more serious intentions? I, I and I know, wouldn't I say serious as far as undermining the importance of creative play, but more I should say, you know, attaching a. a a monetary value or <laughs> lifestyle value to it? Well, I think it took me a while just because I grew up in a small town in Ohio that was also fairly rural. And this was, you know, back in the days before Barnes & Noble or Amazon or anything, you know, we had a, a bookstore in the mall, but it, not for a long time, and it wasn't very big. And I, to be honest with you, it took me a while to realize that you could be a writer. I mean, I really thought all writers were dead. I didn't know. <laughs> I didn't know there were any still alive. We weren't reading them in school, you know. <laughs> that wasn't the stuff we were assigned. So it took me a long time to realize I could actually do this. Uh -huh. um, this could be my life. And I, um, I was very shy when I was younger, and my parents thought that maybe doing community theater would cure me of my shyness, <laughs> which it really didn't. I was still shy. I just wanted to do plays all the time. And so I um, started writing plays for the community theater that I was mm. performing in. Mm. You know, like most community theaters, they struggled with the budget. And, you know, here is this teenager that could help them put on a play for less money. So, I, you know, I came to see writing through that as something that I could do maybe as a job. Mm. Um, and even though I, I don't write plays anymore, just kind of my thinking about plot and story and also dialogue, I think, really came from that. Mm. Um, the importance of that and how that can really move a story along, I think I really learned in community theater. Yeah. Um, so then, you know, I, when I finally moved away from home to go to college, that was the first time that I met real live writers. <laughs> and I started to be assigned writers who were still living um, and also writers who had come from the kind of background I came from, mm. from, you know, a rural working class background um, who didn't live in New York City. For a long time, I thought to be a writer, you had to live in New York City. Mm -hmm. I think. Some writers still think that, but it's absolutely not true. And so I started to see my experience and my community as, you know, being worthy of writing about. Mm. Yeah. So just to, do you remember, like, like you, you mentioned they're feeling worthy of writing about that. Like, tell me more about that. Well, I think it's hard when you... Um, especially in school, you know, when, you, when you're assigned books that just don't have anything to do with you, that don't, um, there's no people that look like you, there's no stories mm. that are like your stories. I think it's hard to think somebody would want to 
to read about this. Mm. Um, I I had a novel come out just a few months ago during the pandemic, Road Out of Winter, and uh, it was mentioned in an L.A. Times article mm. on um, maybe books you might consider picking up instead of Hillbilly Elegy. Yeah. And the writer mentioned in the piece, it was I was really moved by how even in a short paragraph, how deeply she read my book. And she mm. said that my book featured something that was really rare, which is that the main characters are a trio of working class women. Mm. And I thought, well, I guess that, that is kind of rare. It shouldn't be, you know, but, but I, but I think it is. Mm. Um, and so it, I think like maybe a lot of writers, I started out writing what I thought people wanted to hear, mm-hmm. and it wasn't until I was just like, you know what, I need to tell stories for me, um, that I think my writing really got better, really got to what I wanted it to be. Hmm. When did you decide that? Do you well, um, when I, I remember when I was a, a first-year student in college, um, I was First year students weren't allowed to take creative writing classes, and I didn't take creative writing classes in high school. We didn't have anything like that where mm-hmm. I grew up. Um, but we were allowed to take literature classes as first year students. So I was in a literature class, and I was reading a poet from Ohio uh, named James Wright, mm-hmm. who was a big influence on me when I was really young. And he mentioned the town in Ohio that I grew up in, Mansfield, in a mm-hmm. poem. And I was so surprised that this, you know, famous poet had heard of this town, let alone wrote about it, that I fell off my bunk bed. I was on the lower <laughs> bunk, but I, I literally fell off because I, I'd never read that before. I'd never seen my town name in a book. And so I think that was the first moment that I realized, hey, you know, where I come from matters. Wherever you come from matters. And, mm. you know, you should tell that story if you want to. Yeah. So what is it about your upbringing that, that you weren't seeing represented in other fiction or acknowledged perhaps in, in dialogue about fiction? Well, one thing that, um, you know, one of my advice to writers is not to read your review so much. <laughs> it's one thing, I mean, this hasn't happened to me, but it's one thing if the New York Times writes about you. But, yeah. you know, Goodreads and Amazon, those are really for readers. They're not for writers, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, you don't know what who someone is writing the review or what their agenda is. But um, uh, I I did... It, at the same time, it's hard to miss that stuff, you know? It's hard to avoid seeing some things written about your work. Um, and I, I've read a couple reviews that mentioned surprise that my novel wasn't written by a man. Mm. And uh, specifically in as far as the book talks about violence. Yeah. And uh, the violence of poverty, um, the violence of uh, gender violence. Um, the violence of like uh, drug crimes and uh, so forth. Mm -hmm. And that really took me aback because, you know, I feel like if anyone knows about violence, it's, you know, women that have experienced it. Mm -hmm. And I was, it was, the review was trying to present it as a compliment. Mm -hmm. Um, But to me, I thought, you know, it doesn't matter. Yeah, it doesn't matter who tells the story, right? If it reads true to you, it's true. Um, But also, maybe we need to pay more attention to stories of violence that are written by women and stories of poverty and struggle um, and stories of survival. Yeah. Uh, My book is considered speculative. You know, mm-hmm. it's kind of our world, but not really. Um, what makes it different in the world of the book is that there's a really bad winter. Uh, mm. Spring just doesn't come back for two years in a row. Mm. Um, and so, you know, the food supply is in danger. The food chain is in danger. The main character makes a living in agriculture, and she can't do that. Um, and so trying to survive uh, becomes the focus of the story. And, you know... I'm surprised that there aren't more books um, where the main character, the leader, the survivor isn't a young woman. Yeah. Um, but but it seems like in the reaction of the book that that's not so much the case. Hmm. Hmm. 
Yeah. I, it's a random, random aside, but you know, as I've been doing this longer, I notice that the more press, positive press a book gets, the worse the reviews are. <laughs> and, and I don't think it's because the book is worse, but I think it's because people start to feel more of like, you know, willingness to judge what they're reading or look for the flaws. I don't know. Yeah. Just... I, I think it's hard too when you don't, I mean, early in my career when I was trying to get an agent and trying to get other books out that have not seen the light of day and probably shouldn't, you know, mm. I had so many agents tell me, I don't know how to sell this. Mm. And, you know, that's really hard to hear. But at the same time, I think that means that maybe you're doing something different, you know, yeah. or your story isn't the most common story. And I think that's really important, even though it's hard to to find an agent, you know, to get through that. Mm. And so I, I think the agent that I ended up going with, Eric Smith, uh, he's really wonderful, but he also, you know, he understands difference. It's, mm. it's really important to him. Um, and finding somebody who can be your champion, you know, when you are different or your story is different, it may take a lot longer. Yeah. Yeah. And that makes sense to me. That resonates to me. Um, so do you want to talk more about that, that search for an agent and when you decided that you wanted to be a traditionally published author? I mean, sounds like you were a successful editor and then, um, successful freelance journalist as well. You know, we kind of glossed over that, but you know, you, you've got work in the New York times and the Washington post, the Atlantic, the guardian, right? Like. What is it about a book that mattered so much that you'd go through that grinder of finding an agent and getting published? Well, I always wanted to be a novelist. Um, mm. I started publishing, well, at the very beginning, I started um, when I was a, a kid. I actually wrote a column for my local newspaper when I was mm. in junior high, um, <laughs> which thankfully I don't think is online. Uh but, you know, I, I always wanted to do novels, but I just, I've, I've never been able to study fiction. I studied poetry in college because that's mm. who the professors were. You know, there wasn't a fiction writer on staff. It was mm. a small school. And, you know, I, so I started to publish poetry seriously uh, when I was in college. And then my first few books were poetry books. Mm. And poetry is a lot different than fiction, you know. It's hard enough to find an audience for fiction, but for poetry, it's it's really hard. Mm. So most poetry books are published because of contests, and that's what happened to me too, which was really great because you get a little bit of money and you get a little bit of publicity from the contests. Yeah. So they came out on, on university presses because of these contests. But I still always wanted to, to be a novelist, and I was always trying to get an agent. Um, Sometimes, like me, if you're if you started off as something else or you publish something else first, it's hard to get people to see you as anything else. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I think that our country really rewards like you know twenty four year olds writing their first novels, um, and I and I think that's a shame because yeah. I'm sure some of those books are really great, but. I think having already been something else, having lived through some things, you know, the books you're going to write are going to be that much more textured and layered yeah. and experienced. So I really wish that publishing paid a little bit more attention to those kind of writers. But um, I did have a, a couple agents, and I found them the typical way. Um, I would go through novels that I liked that had been published and I would look at the acknowledgements and I would try to find an agent, mm. see if they thank their agent in the acknowledgements. Mm. And I would look online, you know, I would read magazines like Poets and Writers to see if there was an agent interview. Um, and so, you know, I had one agent who signed me a long time ago for a book that will never see the light of day. And, um, this person had a, has a really good reputation and was pretty well known, but just never, ever sent my work out. And I think because they had so many clients, you know, I definitely wasn't, wasn't, you know, uh, top of the rung there. So we eventually parted ways. 
having never sent anything of mine out or, or really done much with it. Um, and then I had a second agent that was like a friend's agent. Mm-hmm. And it was it was a similar thing. You know, I, I don't know if they really liked my work so much, but it was kind of convenient. Um, and I don't think I did the research to find somebody that would really appreciate my work and vice versa. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that is really important, you know, that you really need to find an agent who does a read your work, but then also love your work, you know, because they, they have to be your champion and they can't speak highly of you to publishers if they're not that familiar with you or if they really don't believe in what you have to say. Um, And so I think the lesson in that is that it's very common to have more than one agent in your career. You know, Mm -hmm. you might have to part ways with an agent. And it was really scary and upsetting because I don't like conflict. But also, I know it's hard to find an agent. You know, you may worry, oh, no, I'm never going to find an agent again. But I know so many writers who have been down that road. And, you know, if it happened once, it can happen again. Yeah. And so as far as my agent, Eric, goes, I had written this new book, and I felt that it was different. I really felt in my bones that I'd finally tapped into what I was capable of. And I wasn't as worried about what people thought, and I just went for it. And so I really wanted to find an agent who would go for it, too. And um, I had read a lot of of Eric's um uh, he's, he has a very active social media presence, and so I had read a lot of that, and I had read a lot about him, and, you know, I looked at some of the works he had published, some of the works he had agented, mm. and it seemed like um, not only did people s- seem to really like him as an agent, it also seemed like we had similar sensibilities. Um, like, he likes really weird stuff, mm. and I write weird stuff, you know, and... Um, Diversity is very important to him. Mm-hmm. Uh, he um, donates the proceeds to a book he worked on to organizations that work with foster kids and mm-hmm. helps them get libraries for their foster kids. Yeah. And, you know, that may not be important to everybody, but that kind of stuff was important to me. Yeah. You know, um, uh my book is about women. Uh, the main character in my book is a bisexual woman, openly mm. bisexual, mm. which isn't, you know, something that everybody wants, even now. Um, mm-hmm. I had a, a publishing executive tell me about an earlier draft of the book that it was too much that she was bisexual, you know. <laughs> it was enough that she was poor and a woman. And I thought, uh-huh. oh, gosh, I can't. <laughs> I really need to tell my story. Um, and so finding somebody who trusts you to tell your story, I yeah. think, is the most important thing. Yeah. Not only an agent who is high-powered or who has the connections, but who believes you. Yeah. That matters. Yeah. That feels special. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I imagine, you know, there's there's places where it matters more or less to executives as far as who the lead characters are, right? Like it might be more expected in urban settings. I don't know. Yeah. And I I think that would be interesting to write about as well. You Mm -hmm. know, what kind of expectations we have from rule books, you know, versus, you know, books set in New York city. Um, I, as you talked about, I do also work as a journalist, and sometimes there's a little bleed over between my worlds. Mm-hmm. And I'm I'm working on a piece now about rural women in books and books written by rural women. And you know, like many journalists, I'll like try to find sources and call for sources online and, and ask for suggestions. And yeah. you know, I, I've been ask, asking my contacts what are your favorite books this year by rural women or mm-hmm. or about rural women? And I just haven't gotten a lot of responses. I think yeah. it's just something that we're not maybe hearing about as much. And I know those books are out there, you know, mm-hmm. they just may not be getting the attention that other books are. Yeah. And I imagine that's always true. And in 2020, it may be <laughs> even more of a challenge, but I know some people can read a lot. So yeah. Right. <laughs> so I imagine there's some overlap between um, 
the types of storytelling that you've done, because I, I would consider the, like journalism to be storytelling. It's not narrative fiction. And mm -hmm. there's some element of story to poetry as well. Um, so what, for you, is the common thread between these things? Well, I think you're right in that it is always telling stories. I think that the most successful journalism is a kind of narrative, you know, mm -hmm. even if it's just the narrative of this event that happened or this company or whatever you're writing about. Um, I think you have to set the scene. Yeah. And I think that you, I, for me anyway, I, I really like to focus on people. Yeah. I like to start um, the articles I write with a person, you know, and to get to talk to people. And that to me is really the heart of all stories. You know, is who is this impacting? Who is living this experience? You know, what are they going through? Um, and really, you know, getting to that, I think, is what matters. Mm -hmm. The same thing in, um, in fiction, too. I think that fiction is really about people. It's really about characters. And um, when I've been doing interviews about my novel, I keep being asked, like, well, how did you think of this idea? And I, I don't know if it's ideas so much as it is just people, you know, yeah, how did yeah. you think of this person and what this person might go through and how they might be changed? Yeah. Maybe the answer is by paying attention or I don't know. What was your process for that? Did you come up with an answer? Well, I think that every, I think that every book or project is different. Um, but for me, I know advice I was given early on was to always carry a notebook around, right? So you're always mm -hmm. jotting down ideas and you don't lose them. Mm -hmm. I, I do that a little bit, but then I lose the notebook, you know? So I think for me, if it's a good idea, it will stay with you. And I think it will come back, which I think is important when you think about, you know, you're in the middle of a project and you have a new idea mm -hmm. and the temptation to jump ship is very strong. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That happens to me all the time. But I do believe that if you stick with the project and finish it, that new idea will be waiting for you if it's worthwhile. Um, I also think that for me, if I have a dream about something, that's a sign that I should pay attention to it. Mm. And Road Out of Winter came about because, you know, I was living in Ohio. The weather in Ohio can be a little iffy, but I live most of my adult life in southeastern Ohio, which is a little bit warmer. Mm -hmm. um, but we had a really, really bad winter one year, and spring was just super late, you know, and yeah. I just had this random thought, what if spring never comes back? <laughs> so I was thinking about that for a while, you know, like, what would that be like? What plants would die? How would you get food? How would things break down? Yeah. And then I had this dream of a greenhouse. It was just an image of a greenhouse in winter, uh, snow all around it, but lit from within. And there were two people inside the greenhouse, and they were kind of young adults in their 20s. And there was a little kid with them, but I knew it wasn't their kid mm. somehow in my dream. And so I just thought about those two things, the dream and spring, for a long time. And then I started to think, well, what kind of person in their early 20s would take care of a child that wasn't her own mm. and what kind of person could survive a spring that never came back, you know? Mm. And also what kind of person would be, would live where I lived for most of my life, you know, in rural Ohio, um, what could they take from their upbringing to survive this kind of story? Mm. So that's where it came from for me. Yeah. That's, that's great. Um, it, 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 it's interesting where the ideas come from and how we assign meaning to them. Um, and I know there's discussion about, you know, in, you know, subtext and the idea that in fiction, you don't state your subtext and same in mm -hmm. humor as well. Right. But I assume you, ha you know, that the subtext is why it's important to you. Right. Yeah, I mean, it's... Um... That's a leading question, by the way. I guess that's poor journalism. <laughs> well, I mean, it's, you know, you write about... Well, I, I think it's 
a couple things. I mean, in general, you you write about what matters to you, yeah. and it it finds its way in there whether you want it to or not. Mm. Um, mm-hmm. I didn't intentionally set out to write about someone living in poverty, but you know, I have my own lived experiences of that, so of course that bled into that. Yeah. And of course, you know, I lived in a house with. Um, no running water and uh that's that's in the in the book you know and i lived in a very rural place and i dealt with nature in a certain way and my knowledge and experiences is is in the book too um sometimes especially as a freelance journalist you don't get to choose what you write about mm. which can be frustrating um i i feel like at this point in my career, I, I have to say yes to most things I'm asked to write. Mm. Um, not everything, but, you know, it's hard to turn down a job, yeah. especially now. Yeah. And we don't always get to choose the focus or the final edits or the headline. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, that's true of fiction, too. You know, my book wasn't called Road Out of Winter at first. It was called The Grower. Okay. Um, <laughs> Which makes I sense. Really it makes like, sense with the greenhouse. Yeah, I like because it focuses on the woman, the main character. But uh, the marketing department of my publisher thought it wasn't exciting enough, so mm. <laughs> we had to get something exciting. So it's a hard line to walk between, you know, this really matters to me, and I don't have any control over this. Right. So doing the best that you can, and knowing, you know, what you can push back against, and maybe what you can't. Um, For journalism, you know, I write a lot about uh, poverty and about Appalachia, where I live for most of my life, Mm -hmm. and about parenting. And and sometimes with all of those things, especially as a freelancer, you get editors who don't have experience with those issues, and they don't understand that, you know, certain language isn't okay. You know, you can't insert that phrase into my piece. That's disrespectful to the people I wrote about. So for me, you know, the fights I try to do is just comes down to that, like respecting the people who are in the story, respecting their experiences, having empathy, you know, and trying to be as accurate as possible. Mm. Now, I, I know that you have you feature in your in your bio and ingrid was telling me about you as well right that that you're partially deaf yes Um, and so how has that become like how 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 is that a part of your story looking at it now well i think going back to the beginning i think that probably also played into why i became a writer I think that the isolation I felt was partially because we lived in the middle of nowhere, but it was also partially because, you know, I couldn't hear everything that was happening. You know, Mm. I, I couldn't, I couldn't always participate in things and conversations. Mm. And, you know, I think I became a little shy and reserved because of that, Mm -hmm. because it's easier, it was easier for me to hold back than to, you know, try to jump in in a big group conversation or, a big dinner at a restaurant, which is one of my least favorite things, you know, because mm-hmm. it's hard for me to follow the conversation always. Mm-hmm. So I think uh, telling my own story became a way to participate, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I think I think now, um, obviously, being different in any way gives you empathy, you know, mm-hmm. it makes you understand. Um, it helps you want to seek out other people who are different too, you know. I I have been writing for the New York Times, like you said. I'm just a freelancer, but I have written a few stories for them on uh, the cannabis industry, mm-hmm. uh, which is a part of my, my novel, though not really the industry part. It's more, you know, um, a woman struggling with... Uh, criminality and and the poverty part of it. Mm -hmm. But I came to write about that subject through my novel. And that is an industry now that is, you know, there's a lot of money in it. There's a lot of corporations in it. But the challenge for me, which is a challenge I like, is to tell the stories of people who aren't necessarily part of that. Um, Mm -hmm. I just had a piece come out that focused on a, a black family cannabis farm in a world and in an area that is really dominated by white men, you know, mm-hmm. and what this 
farm started by a brother and sister, what they're doing. Yeah. You know, and I also talked about a, a mother and daughter who also have a farm. So any way I can write about people who are considered different like me, I think yeah. is is really important to me. Yeah. Um, at the same time, I also feel like being partially deaf has made me really pay attention to language. Mm-hmm. And I did start as a poet, so that may be why language is important to me, but just the sounds of words, because I can't always hear them and I have to really think about it. Mm-hmm. You know, the sounds of words are a really big deal to me, even in fiction. Mm. And I really want it to be musical as well as make sense and, um, you know, tell a story. And I think that gets me in trouble sometimes in journalism because I do (laughs) want it to be beautiful as well as accurate. And that's not always what an editor is looking for. No. (laughs) (laughs) Do you think that, you know, I, I know journalism's changed a lot in the last 30 years. Um, and I studied journalism in college and did the college oh. newspaper. And, you know, I remember, you know, the dream that was being sold of journalism, right? Um, you know, it, it has shifted, though, to some degree, right, in some corners to be more of a performance than a rendering of facts, right? Like I imagine in journalism early on, the goal was to be invisible. Right. Right. And, and maybe that's still true for when you're writing for a client like the New York Times or the Washington Post. I don't know. What, <laughs> what is that like? I know there's a lot of authors who had an interest in journalism, so I feel okay asking this question. <laughs> it's my show, Dan. Well, I, I think, you know, I think it can be a lot of things now, and that's one of the things I like about it, because mm. I do write more personal essays sometimes, And then I do write more like straight analytical, this is what happened type pieces sometimes. Mm -hmm. And I like them both, you know, and they, they require different muscles of the brain. I like that about it. You know, Mm -hmm. I, but I was one of those weird people who liked writing papers in college, you know, so I like doing research and I like, um, sewing together interviews with people and facts. And, you know, I I like that process too. And it's a nice break um, from fiction. It's just different. But, you know, that said, I think there's, there's still a debate now. It's like, do people who have an experience with the community should be, should they be allowed to write about that community? Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I think that even a journalist who is, pretending to be totally invisible and not to have a stake in the story. You know, we all have stakes in stories, you know, yeah. and we can't change where we came from and the experiences we had, yeah. you know, even if it's not on the page for everyone to see, you know, it's still part of you. Um, and I think that by not letting people who have an experience with the community write about that community, you're losing something, you know, you're really losing the background that they have. Yeah. Um, we dealt with that a lot living as I did in Appalachian, Ohio, you know, that's a place that people who don't live there love to write about. Um, They love to talk about how it's the poorest community in Ohio. And they love to Mm -hmm. talk about, you know, who are they voting for this election season and to, you know, kind of make these judgments having not lived there. And, you know, I feel like Appalachia, like, like most places probably is really complicated And I don't think you can get that from definitely not a phone call, but I don't think you can get that from even like dropping in for a weekend to write your piece for the AP. Right. I think you really have to, um, you really have to live with it for a while to maybe even begin to understand what the stories are. Um, and I also think that that, you know, saying that a journalist totally has to be invisible all the time. I think that really does a disservice to local journalism. Mm-hmm. which is still there. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's still hanging on in many places, like where I lived, Appalachian, Ohio. You know, there's two newspapers there, and there's a student newspaper, mm. you know, and they have small staffs, and, you know, they struggle, but they are still there telling their stories. And I just think that we have to protect that as much as we can, you know. Yeah. We have to have community newspapers and local journalism. Yeah. I Well, and I imagine... You know, part of that is because if our stories matter, for us to feel like our stories matter, somebody has to write about us, right? 
and Absolutely. contextualize it in a way that feels true. Yeah. And, and maybe that's part of the tug and, and pull of it, right, is whether or not we're writing about people mm-hmm. and why we're writing. And maybe the why isn't as cut and dry. Maybe it's not black and white issue that we made it seem like <laughs> back in school. Right. And, you know, so much of the world keeps changing. Um I, you know, I don't know if I can do what I do as a freelancer forever. I don't know if it's, if it's going to be here. You know, I don't know how, when the pandemic is over, as I hope it is one day, I don't know what the world's going to look like afterwards. So I think part of being a writer in any genre is you got to, you got to go and shift and change. You know, things are, you're not going to write the same thing forever. You're not going to write the same way forever. The Uh, world is going to shift, you know, and you just have to keep moving. Yeah. And, and, you know, a dispassionate fact-based way to look at what you're doing is you have multiple streams of income, right? Yeah. (laughs) But, (laughs) but from a creative side, you're doing other things. So right now you have a book deal, um, you have another book coming out next year, is that right? I do. I have a novel coming out uh, next fall, if the world's be- still here. Uh-huh. Um, it's another <laughs> or your novel. publisher. <laughs> <laughs> right, fingers crossed. Yeah, same publisher, uh, Mira Books. It's a novel called Trashlands, mm-hmm. and it's also a speculative fiction but it's also kind of set in Appalachia like my like Road Out of Winter is okay. but it's set a little further in the future um, in a world where plastic has become currency basically mm. Mm. Um, which sadly we may be headed there I don't know but in the book um, no new plastic can be made but yeah. there's so much plastic everywhere that people kind of fish it out and recycle it for money huh. and in this world, the book focuses on this uh, single mother who wants to be an artist and how there isn't really a place for that in the world that she mm-hmm. lives in. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There's a little bit of subtext there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's right. <laughs> yeah. So it's another standalone novel, though. So you're writing standalone mm-hmm. novels, which is... yeah. Interesting. Is that by choice? Were you asked to do a sequel for Road Out of Winter, or was it just not appropriate to the story? Uh, I've not been asked by the publisher. I have been asked by readers Mm -hmm. (laughs) and my parents, uh, who, uh, I don't know, I I don't think my parents, I don't think parents ever like our books, so they always want something else. (laughs) Um, But I uh, I don't know. I mean, I could see... I could see something, uh, one book, a book series that I read very early in the pandemic, um, like many people, I had a hard time at the start of the pandemic kind of focusing on reading and, you know, my brain was just running all over the place. So the the first books I was able to really sit down and enjoy um, were a trio of books, um, uh, the book of the unnamed midwife by Meg Mm -hmm. Ellison. Mm -hmm. And those books are speculative and they're also set during a pandemic, but it was so different than our pandemic. It felt like comfort to me. Mm -hmm. And those books also do something cool, which is that um, the two books after the first, they take a kind of minor character from the first story and they Mm -hmm. build on their story. Mm -hmm. So it's not like a sequel as we normally think of it traditionally, but it's like uh, building a minor character story up. And I think that's really fascinating. And mm-hmm. I could see doing something like that with Road Out of Winter. Uh, specifically, there's a child in the book who um, doesn't have a huge role, but I kind of wonder what this child's life will be in this mm-hmm. new world. Mm-hmm. Mm. Something something to think about. And I know there's the looming prospect of another Dust Bowl in a few years. More good news, right? <laughs> Right. Well, I, I like a lot of writers of speculative fiction or science fiction. I was asked a lot of uncomfortable questions at the start of the pandemic. Like, Mm. um, did the pandemic influence your writing? And, you know, (laughs) traditional books like mine, you know, it was written a while ago, like well before the pandemic. And, um, and we were all done well before the pandemic started. 
Um, but when you write about like a, a worldwide disaster and then a worldwide disaster happens, mm-hmm. you know, you get asked a lot of questions about it. Mm-hmm. And it is, it is scary and sad to see a lot of that stuff sort of come true, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, early in the pandemic, I was doing a reading and I was reading a part of the book that I hadn't read out loud for a while, which was probably mm-hmm. a mistake. Mm-hmm. And it was the part in the book where the main character gets a letter from the school district mm-hmm. that they have decided to close the schools for a couple months um, to kind of deal with this extreme cold they're having. Mm-hmm. And as I read the, that part out loud, I actually kind of felt ill because I realized, you know, I'd gotten similar emails about my son's school, Yeah, you know? Yeah. Um, and a friend of mine said that her husband was talking about going to get a space heater and recently, and she said, don't you know, they're all out of space heaters because she was thinking about my book, you know, mm. and they were all out of space heaters in the book. Yeah. So it, it is pretty intense to see things you just thought about kind of come true. Um, but at the same time, you know, now we know what a pandemic is like for real. <laughs> and I think it's going to influence what we write going forward, you know, yeah. how we think about um, health and security and, you know, the feelings we might have in some kind of worldwide emergency. I think the writing that's going to come out is a little different. Yeah. Yeah. I I feel that I've experienced that personally. I've there are certain stories that I just don't feel are important to tell anymore right now. I'm not sure what that says about me, but you know, that's why my I, own story. I actually, my, the draft of a novel I just finished yeah. is, is not speculative. It's like realism. And I think the reason is because I needed a break, you know, mm. I needed a break from dramatic, scary stories. Mm. And for me, in my life, the break has always been writing these novels that are scary and imaginative. Yeah. But now the break was writing a story that was just like, you ordinary. know, an ordinary occurrence. Uh-huh. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> that, that makes total sense to me. And something anchoring when, when bad things happen, but nothing else bad really seems to happen. It could be nice. Right. So you've also, you know, and maybe linked to that indirectly, uh, is you've also been on the moth as a storyteller and you know that's kind of true life storytelling right what was that like and how did that come about uh that came about because i was working i still do write for them um with a nonprofit journalism organization Mm. called the economic hardship report reporting project and what they do is they look for journalists like me uh with lived experience of poverty and um, just uh, help support the writing of of pieces about that. Not necessarily about our own experience, but just about issues of poverty. Mm -hmm. Um, And so they've been doing a lot now uh, with journalists and the pandemic and and writing about various issues around that. And so uh, the Moth had contacted them because they were doing um, a storytelling night in Charleston, West Virginia, which is close to where I was living Mm -hmm. in Ohio, just kind of over the river there. And they were looking for someone kind of local to tell a story. And um, it was a terrifying experience, but it was also a wonderful experience. Mm. It was, um, it reminded me so much of the theater I used to do as a child, Uh, but it was very intense. We, uh, my partner and I went to Charleston and, you know, I had the kind of bones of a story to tell and I was with the other storytellers there and we just kind of workshopped it with the director and talked about, you know, things to play up and things to play down and, Mm. you know, make sure you say this line or, you know, don't forget this part, but it is, it is memorized. It is a live story told on stage. So Mm. you don't have notes. I didn't know that when I was just listening on the radio, (laughs) but there's no notes. And you have to memorize it fast. And it wasn't memorized exactly. It was more like the outline of it. So it really is Um, a performance. It really is, yeah. Yeah. But also, it was just such a supportive environment. Um, Before I went on, one of the other storytellers turned to me and grabbed my hand, and she said, everyone out there loves you, and everyone wants you to do well. 
I don't know if that's true, but that that really helped me. And yeah. actually, I in the summertime, I teach high school writers in a high school writing workshop, yeah. and they have to do a reading at the end of the, the week. And I always tell them that. I tell them, everyone out there loves you, and everyone wants you to do well. Yeah. So I think having the confidence to tell your own story, that it will be received, it will be heard, is really yeah. important. That is important. What did you talk about? I talked about... Um, I talked about being a new single mother. Mm. Uh, I was a single. I became a single mother pretty much right after my son was born. My mm-hmm. marriage kind of ended mm-hmm. unexpectedly for me. And um, what got me through it, uh, along with my friends and my parents, uh, what got me through it was actually uh, discovering a love of street art and graffiti, mm. and how I would take my son for long walks, and I would look for graffiti pieces in the alleys where we lived Mm -hmm. and how that became a way to make my life meaningful and to love art again. Mm. Mm. And that's, that's a beautiful thing to discover. And it sounds like must've resonated really well to be able to perform that on the moth as a story. Well, it it resonated with my son as well, apparently, because he's, uh, he's nine years old now and he wants to be an artist. Oh, that's awesome. (laughs) He spends all the time that he's not online at school. He spends it making art. That's great. Is that because you're making art too? (laughs) I think he's making a lot more than I am, but that's okay. You know, that's, you know, that's how it goes right now. This is the season of the pandemic. So we have to adjust our art accordingly. But, uh, yeah. (laughs) Does that mean you're you're having to do a little less than you normally would? I I think creatively I am doing less, but mm-hmm. you know I'm telling myself that it isn't forever. You know, it like I said, it the world is going to change. We don't know how it's going to change, and and your art's going to change too. You know, yeah. what you make and how you make it is going to change. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's awesome. Well, Allison, for people who want to learn more about you, how can they do that? Uh, I do have a website, which is just my name, Allison Stein, A L I S O N S T I N E dot com. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm on Twitter, which mm-hmm. is also just my name, mm-hmm. and I'm on Instagram at Ali Stein Writes. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, I, you know, my novel Road Out of Winter is out now, and hopefully Trashlands will be out next fall. That's great. Well, Allison, it's been a pleasure having you on the podcast. Likewise. Thank you so much. And thank you for all you do to continue to inspire people to keep going. Thank you. I hope you've enjoyed today's episode of The Fearless Storyteller. As a reminder, any and all links can be found in the show notes. And if you're enjoying this podcast, will you please consider leaving a review? By doing so, you'll be helping new listeners discover the Fearless Storyteller podcast.